Okay, hello, it's so good to see you. Thank you so Hi. much for joining us. Um, I haven't seen you since the since the centennial, so it's nice to you know see your face. So um, yes, you too. Yeah. So I I want to start by asking you know how are you doing? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a good question. I I should say I feel quite okay, uh, and by quite or relatively speaking, I guess it's everybody seems to be relative from you know how we respond to that question um always in hope that people that we do talk to are fine relatively speaking mm -hmm. um but no i feel quite okay perhaps slightly more settled and balanced than uh perhaps a couple months ago when you know for everybody so many things changed and for us uh and my family we have three kids my wife and I, you know, uh, so many things started happening so quickly. And of course, as we know, concerts were canceled. The rest of the season soon thereafter were canceled. Um, and uh, at the same time, um, we were given notice that we are now responsible also for helping to teach our children at home. So while I guess the the business side of things of, of performing and of working um uh, we're still trying to be figured out uh it's i guess the family that you try to figure out okay what is what is going to be the uh the new rhythm because it was this process of you know first disorientation and then sort of like you're, you you've gone blind from one day to the next and we're slowly trying to in the dark find find a wall that that we can kind of hold on to and find and say, oh, okay so before before i can look for an exit let me try to find a wall first yes, yes. you know and this whole uh, process of you know initially finding information about what's going on and uh, what information you can trust and so on and and gathering if you will um around you a circle or a net of um good information uh, things that you can build trust on and that you can build relationships on um that was a, a long process and also because everybody was going through the process that you knew that wherever you were reaching out to they are trying to figure it out themselves as well so for me personally it's it it was um a challenging time but also um a time that we saw as an opportunity immediately my wife and i you know to understand uh we are being given this this challenge or the challenges that we face um in the past even before this small or large uh they're given as an opportunity to to grow and, and to move forward, which was very hard to figure out, of course, at, at first. But um, so I should say maybe more settled now um, than, than before. But yes, thank you. We're doing quite fine, considering. Good. And can you remind me and tell everybody else, how old are your kids again? They are, our oldest is 12. Um, so we have a daughter, uh, oldest daughter, uh, our son is 10 and then a little daughter uh, who's almost eight. So they're roughly two years apart. You definitely have your hands full when it comes to all of the e-learning that they're having to do and you know, kind of keeping them entertained as well. Yes, and as a matter of fact, um, looking at my haircut, <laughs> it was <laughs> one of the many quarantine activities just to keep them engaged. No, but <laughs> pretty well right i mean yeah. you know they all were allowed to just take the you know this machine and then just you know if you wanted to have a go, very have a go. i told them I, very likely i will not be performing <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully it's going to get warmer soon so no but we can't complain from boredom if you will you know yes it's one thing to of course keep them engaged and uh basically learn ourselves of how to how to teach them and how to get through schoolwork and things like that, which I think a lot of parents were faced with. 
um, in this also for this age group. Um, but um, we are getting through it and they are keeping very busy and, and we're thankful that they have each other. We know that some of the neighbor's kids and we sometimes wave across you know, the streets or to the neighbors, um, some of them don't have any siblings. And uh, we know that they're very much yearning for, for this connection and even going out. And you know, we're, we tell them they are very fortunate to have each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, I know you're busy with that, um, you know, keeping your kids, you know, settled and entertained. And But what are you personally doing to cope right now with this time, both like musically and non-musically? Well, um, creating laughter is a good thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> good, yeah. And activities, um, you know, things that that allows to just to avoid too much screen time. Um, uh, yeah. You know, we are also trying to, you know, look at things like Stephen Colbert or, you know, other shows and other uh, commentary that keeps us sane. Uh, I largely draw my news information from uh, my German sources. Uh, okay, yeah, smart. <laughs> um, but in general, not being too overflown, you know, with and overwhelmed with uh, news and information, just really what's essential and then focusing on on the things you do have uh, a, an influence on and that you can connect with, you know, if you will, person to person, even with the social distancing. But um, musically speaking, I was, of course, very much looking forward to making music, uh, especially you know, in my inaugural seasons with uh, both the Milwaukee Symphony as well as Civic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, normally during this time, I would be looking at scores um, and, you know, studying or just um, looking at new scores that are sent to me and so on. And as soon as this news hit a couple months ago, um, I put all of that aside and and it took me weeks to actually look at, at at any music or any scores because I didn't want there to be, I wanted to be a clean cut of expectations of, of doing that. And also at the same time, immediately changing my focus to uh, the family uh, yeah. and our kids and also, um, you know, the orchestra here and the musicians making sure that everybody's okay and just seeing what you can do what you can do to help um both practically and uh, also mentally um and the the scope and the range of uh needs are of, of course in the spectrum they're they're covered they're covering every part but my my gratitude is for this time to have have had with the kids, you know, not traveling at all, just being home, learning how to, if you will, see them grow, not just in spurts, you know, you, you, sometimes we travel for a week and then we come back. Sometimes we travel for a month and, and you miss out and you come back. And uh, now it's this time to really uh, be there for them and, and also learn deep inside how to how to be patient how to how to learn to to build relationship and how to use your words in a meaningful way more than before um and also because they're always changing nothing you know from one day to the next the uh, managing expectations becomes a very fluid thing it's mm -hmm. it's an organism that's like a mushroom it's just <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what direction it's going to go, I guess, depending on the mushroom. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, we've we've had a lot of um, changes, especially and I talk a lot about family time, but it has been quite um, the focus because in the last even less than a year, um, going from uh, our home in Boston where I was working with the Boston Symphony um, for a number of years and, uh, you know, the kids feeling, okay, already a disconnect there and then taking them on a study trip, we decided um, if they're going to 
have this time away already and uh, changing to a new environment. Let's take them on a study trip to Germany. <laughs> um, and that in itself was also challenging, you know, uh, of course, because they had never been to a school. We enrolled them in German schools uh, in Germany and, uh, you know, uh, new environment um, and, and speaking that we speak German at home, but, you know, using the language and the school environment and for my wife and I to just uh, see through that was was quite the challenge. So we had just arrived as a family beginning of this year. So since January, they were in school. And so this time was actually quite welcome to for us to just um, come into the home. Um, you know, we're still unpacking boxes, orienting ourselves that way, learning much about uh, the life uh, on the third coast between Chicago and Milwaukee. Um, and um, so that has been the most important, you know, uh, relationship, I guess, between the non-musical and the musical um, coping of this, this crazy time that we're trying to focus on the things we, we can to a degree control or have an impact on. And that's those relationships um, um, that are in the home. Yeah, and that was actually an answer to my follow-up question, which was that you just moved across the world recently, and I was going to ask, well, you know, what was that transition like, maybe before all of this craziness happened? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, this, the transition was, um, um, you know, okay. I mean, it's it's really that you, you look at it as as an organism of of a family. Um, of five trying to take everyone with you. You cannot do, you know, it's kind of like going on a bike tour, which we did this morning. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, it, to me, there's no difference uh, from doing, going on a big trip, you know, uh, across the sea uh, or, or taking a bike trip around the neighborhood. You know, you cannot move along if one person is, is either thirsty or, <laughs> <laughs> Or, or the helmet isn't on right. right. So it's, no, but I think that for us having, you know, going through this um, has made us, and the kids I feel even more resilient now. You know, at the time there was a lot of, um, you know, if you will, kind of normal childhood uh, um, disorientation and complaining about the things that you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, things that we as adults now are experiencing, of course, all of us, um, and then helping them, helping them, guiding them through it. So, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting because it seems that all of it has been coming in in this wave form for for us specifically, and for other families that we know have been moving from one place to the other. Um, so, yeah, it but it but it was fine in that we are thankful we were able to do that and, and see things with them and for them to see family members, some of my relatives in, in Germany and in Europe. Um, so we're, we're, we're grateful for that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, so kind of moving into these like more mental health oriented questions. Um, what is your experience as a conductor leading a group of musicians that might include people struggling with mental illness, and you know, how does that kind of inform your approach as a leader? Yes, you know, I mean, it's it's so important um, to look at it. For me, I grew up seeing how, in my family, my father, having been a conductor, um, dealt with it. Um, you know, in a way unique perhaps to him. And I think it's such a, from a person to person perspective um, and, and now watching what the profession of conductor is and how it's dealt with over the past few years changed and changing, um, especially in relation to the orchestra. But it's so important to understand if our job is to lead an ensemble that can, potentially have such joy and such feel such strength and such empowerment 
um, to perform these extraordinary works of music that in themselves just are such a source of, uh, of energy um, that in order to get everyone to be at the utmost, at their best, at the top of their game, if you will, um, you know, then mental health, of course, plays such a, a great role and sort of with um, leadership uh, for conductors, you know, yes, there are master classes and in classrooms, conducting teachers would, you know, always tell their students or perhaps should tell their students there is a component about being conductor has nothing to do <laughs> with how you beat patterns technically and so on. It, it is that you need to at least have antennas to a degree um, or develop those antennas to to understand and be aware of of the the spirit or the atmosphere that is in the orchestra and um you know to to a degree to be attuned to that and to a degree to be um to care for that and everybody will tell you something else but I can only, for me, it's, it's, I've watched it growing up, so I can only function in a certain uh, degree and a certain level uh, of, of this, which is I've, you know, seen my father would mention around the dinner table when uh, he felt a certain musician was going through a difficult time, either personally or with an illness, maybe physical or mental. And uh, to to ask about it or to how that he was just concerned, not knowing what the answer was or how to resolve, but sort of that there is a concern and that that is important. Um, Would he check in with those people or was it more just like I'm expressing concern? Yes, I think that in, in his way, uh, he would. And uh, I mean, to give you an example, I would, uh, there were a couple of times when he would take me on uh, in the car, driving to someone's home. I mean, he would obviously sometimes only, you know, maybe call them first and so on. But there were occasions where he felt the only way that that he felt he could make an impact or that he could encourage someone or that he could get to someone and, and really show his support was to actually be there in person. And he would sometimes take me, and I was still very little, and uh, I could see that you know, the impact was great, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's a fine line because nowadays, you know, um, especially in the United States, I feel that uh, conductors are taught to just be, really separate themselves. Yeah. You know, they are, and, and this is like the first time I heard of this was in a, uh, uh, in a session, in a panel, I think, discussion um, about, the role of management or administrative roles in the United States, you know, in, in, in orchestras and so on, uh, versus the musicians and unions and things like that. Uh, and, and they're vastly different in every country. But, you know, where somebody said, well, the, the conductor is, is management and as a musician, you should never deal with the, the conductor. And it was completely foreign to me. Hmm. Um, because, you know, as conductors, we we do wish the best for the musicians. We do care, but at the same time, we have to learn to, to respect the level of distance that, that they prefer, of course, in order to deal with their um, challenges. So we also, I would never um, say that I have all the answers, never. I, I don't, of course. Um, but as an organism in the orchestra um, and being a member, if you feel, you know, many conductors feel that they are musical members of the orchestra, that we, we feel when there's one, something that is um, ailing, that, that it's like an organism. You want to make sure that that is healed, you know, to some degree. Uh, no orchestra is 100%. You know, we, it's, it's fluid, of course. But to um, learn how to be an organism that functions that way and, and at least seeks it out or is open and accessible to addressing um, those things. I, th I do think that's very important. And um, every conductor um, has to decide where they are on that spectrum. Yes. Um, and, uh, and we 
again, this is a balance between just respecting um, the distance that, you know, that the, each musician prefers. That's why you have the personnel managers or other people that they can go through. And at the same time, offering them an, a level of understanding and, and support. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I do, one thing that I think a lot of us appreciate working with you is that you are very accessible. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation right now proves that. And I, you know, I've noticed after some rehearsals, you might come over to the winds and just kind of check in and just be like, how's everyone doing? Do you need anything? And like, that's so rare. Um, and I think, you know, it speaks to your previous experience with your dad checking in on people too. Um, and I think it's, it's really great that, cause we feel more connected and then we want to play well for you, obviously. And I think that's highly underestimated a lot of times with conductors is, is that level of accessibility and just like, just caring about the people that you're working with as people and not just as an instrument. Um, well, I mean, it's also because the way in which, you know, I, I didn't want to become a conductor until quite late. I mean, you know, many um, conductors I talk to now, uh, uh, colleagues or, or even students um, that I've taught, uh, they, they tell me, oh, I've known since I was, you know, a young teen or <laughs> in middle school that I wanted to become a conductor. Yes, I'll play the violin, but really ultimately I'm doing it to become a conductor. And I was never that way. And of course, maybe it was because of what I grew up with and that to me, the, the role of a conductor was something that was vastly to me uh, unattainable, that level of um, knowledge or professionalism or understanding that we are, we are mentoring people. Um, we don't need to play every instrument in the orchestra, uh, which is something that people <laughs> ask me, do you have? No, we don't have to, but an understanding of how they work and how you can reach the limitation in order to get um, to the absolute most amazing, you know, top level performances. Yes, that, that of course, but just to, for me, you know, to grow up um, seeing that, but at the same time having the opportunity as a hobby, as an undergraduate um, at Columbia University, where I wasn't thinking at all of um, having a career in music, to just exploring music with other students who are, you know, uh, in medicine or, you know, English majors or whatever they were, and we would come together and do Bach cantatas or oratorios and some operas. And, and uh, it was just, you know, checking in with each other and exploring that together. So that dynamic of us going together on this journey of discovery, that was the most exciting thing for me to witness. And that's why I wanted to do it. And whenever I get the opportunity to, to relive that, that's when I think the music making becomes very personal and, and, and flourishes. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, so I imagine it must have been difficult. I don't know if your father expected you to become a conductor, but I imagine watching somebody like your parent be so successful in that field, you know, was pretty maybe intimidating. Um, so how, what ultimately led you to wanting to be a conductor? When did you, what made you decide this is what I want to do? Yeah, it's, you know, for me with watching, as you said, uh, my father, you know, I could have never imagined that I would, um, do it that profession. Um, and with the expectations and so on and and this this balance which i understand better now back then sort of this internal uh monologue or dialogue if you will with oneself of the balance between uh the fear factor of are you able enough are you worthy enough are you good enough um are you prepared enough um to the balance of, well, is this really bringing me joy? Is this really building me up? Is this really something that allows me to be passionate about life and, and make me connect, want to connect with other people? And uh, ultimately, that side won, the side of, uh, you know, I would like 
for this, if I'm going to do this, and my father never pushed me at all. He would come in, you know, the back of a room when, when I was trying very badly to conduct an ensemble <laughs> and just say, well, you know, that, that wasn't bad, you know, it was, it was very, very nice. I, and he enjoyed it, and, but he would never say anything else. And in the end, you know, in, on vacation, we would sit next to each other, look at scores and explore some things, but never with this feeling of, oh, you're going to be a conductor, never, ever. And it was, you know, ultimately the opportunity and this, this joy, as I said, I think that exploring music without this pressure of having to please a specific audience or to be in front of anybody specific, um, that freedom was, was, was given when I was doing it as a, as a student with others and finding also repertoire that, uh, that I didn't grow up with, uh, uh, with my father doing it, but that I, I found a great passion in, in exploring myself. So um, to me, that was the most important uh, finding to, to really feel so much joy and so much empowerment. Um, also, as you know, I was composing at the time, was playing several instruments uh, growing up, you know, trumpet and, and piano and percussion and and uh, always gravitating towards wanting to play an instrument uh, and practicing every day, you know, for hours and hours. And that, that brought me joy. So this, this move to become a, a conductor was something uh, that, that ultimately was caused by this feeling that I understand that uh, this is a joyful profession that can reach people and it's, it's making me feel feel this great sense of joy and opportunity to connect and to explore something that I wouldn't want to fit end. I don't want this, this feeling to end, you know? That's wonderful. Yeah, I think it can be difficult for young, younger musicians right now, even before all of this happened, you know, going through audition after audition. And I think sometimes, at least I personally, lose kind of my connection to that joy until you know, I'm performing on stage with like Civic or just my colleagues. And so I think it's important to remember, you know, what about it we love when we're in the midst of this kind of grind to just win a job at all. Um, and I think yeah. that's, it's very difficult to navigate. Um, and I think those pressures can be very high and, you know, reconnecting with that joy is very important. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I think it's wonderful that um, you and, and your colleagues are putting this issue of mental health, um, you know, out there and talking about it because um, the, the main thing is we are all in, in, in different ways affected by this. We all have mental health. We all are finding ways in which to um, stay, you know, healthy, not just, you know, physically, also spiritually. Um, and all of that feeds into this mental health and where we find our self-worth and all of that. Um, for me, it's, you know, also not seeking out help when it's too late. Uh, we, you well, know, it, we never want that to happen. But um, for instance, also my wife, I mean, she, uh, you know, is she puts a very strong uh, emphasis on us, you know, with, with, with our relationships with our kids, mental health uh, with, with them. Uh, that's a big priority. She's a pianist, but also she's uh, a pianist and uh, with, with a background in studying psychology in college. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is very important to us. And we want to make sure that the kids don't feel that uh, success academically is more important than than your your mental health or that you or your relationships and um, you know for me there are so many things to stay healthy with including uh, you know your physical how you eat and the things that you read um, and then also spiritually uh, for me uh, I'm you know I am a Christian so for me the spiritual health is something that has helped me in, in various ways because 
it's, I would think about the things that would make me flourish, you know, mentally and spiritually, and the things that would help me um, kind of uh, dismantle idols that I think that all musicians are plagued by, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's recognition, it's, it's achievement, approval, affirmation, uh, love, fame, whatever it is, you know, all these have been broken down for me completely when I uh, accepted uh, my faith. Um, and I grew up also around, you know, faith and, and uh, a praying family, a praying mother and father. And so uh, for me, this initial conflict of, of also going into the profession with some fear that was broken down because I feel that, and this is something about, you know, mental health. It's not that because I've accepted um, this life uh, understanding that I've been giving, given this gift um, that all of a sudden all of these problems are gone away. Mm. But, you know, I'm still facing a lot of these, but it's now become a quest to make sure that those are taken care of and that we every day break down uh, these um, issues and idols and things that we think we have to get done. Or for instance, when I uh, realized one time uh, that even if I studied, you know, these scores and those scores every day, and if I had this time and even if I lived until I was 95, uh, there's no way I, I would be able to uh, study all those scores or all of, or get a chance to conduct all those pieces and it's a it was a, a relief there's no way that any of us could you know be able to do that and to allow for a variation in that and and um, a balance between what it is that's essential and non-essential so that we are not blinded so much by just the drive that that ultimately uh, doesn't allow us to see some really valuable things uh, along the way. That's wonderful. That's really great. So what, uh, you talked a little bit about your faith being a way for you to kind of accept things that are out of your control. Um, what are some other ways you valve out or process the stress of daily life um, have you ever been to, if you feel like talking about, have you ever been to therapy or experienced anything like that? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I mean, I think that it's really important to, for us to understand seeking out help uh, and, and that skill um, and that muscle is something that we should encourage each other to train. Um, I think that we would learn things much quicker uh, because uh, in my opinion, I, you know, in my experience also having seen and having experienced myself, if I, you know, when I was little, I, I think now I wish I could have had the courage to ask um, about this and about that. Um, and I was very, very shy, very runs in the family. I feel my father, would say he was the quietest child in his family and his and his class and um and you know that that kind of story actually helped me confront my fears when i had to first go in front of a larger group of people um mm -hmm. but many people also you know didn't know that about my father for instance but he when he he had two older sisters <laughs> and when when he told them i think i would like to be a conductor you know they're like ah you you little one <laughs> yeah um and um he had to learn that you know speak up and really speak also finding way of finding uh, uh topics and finding a purpose and and in in term in musical terms, a composer and uh, a meaning that you really want to fight for in order to get it right. Mm. Um, you know, in that sense, that was that was sort of the way to deal with that. Um, and uh, and I, now I forgot the, the the gist of your question was. It was just how how do you you know process the stress of of daily life? How do you maybe like 
how do you check in with yourself? You know, some people journal or meditate or go to therapy or yeah. basically what are your kind of coping mechanisms? Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, for me, it's uh, finding the time to, yes, reflect, um, having um, healthy relationships, accountability partners, um, I personally like to, um, you know, especially when I know I'm facing tough decisions, um, that I would like to pray uh, through them uh, and find out really, you know, what is the wisest way to to move ahead and move forward. Um, and yeah, I was starting out to say, you know, seeking help, um, uh, asking for help is something that I find the most courageous thing, you know. Um, nowadays, and I feel that uh, also dealing with failure um, and how we can grow from that from one step to the next, I think, is another. And uh, dealing with failure comes almost, it's almost, you know, it has that strong uh, relationship with asking for help or confronting the fears, you know. Um, for me, standing, for instance, for the first time, not just in front of a, a podium, but, you know, playing instruments growing up and having to be in that recital. Uh, um, there were moments of, you know, there were blackout moments, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. where I simply said, I'm sorry, uh, I can't remember the rest of the piece. I, you know, walked off the stage when I was a little boy. <laughs> and, oh. and, you know, those are the things that, that, of course, stay with you and you wonder, can you actually be in this there's no way that you're going to be a professional musician if you, if you you know can but but the resilience part is you know about trying to uh face those fears repeatedly and also ask yourself on the other side you know what are the what are the benefits and and for me to to understand the gift that music is for us you know or certain other aspects of, of life and art and creativity um, that it's not about me necessarily it's definitely not about me going out there and and um, showing how good or how uh, perfect I am performing something but uh, that I can be of service in something that is life giving and life bringing and that to me represents not the end to all the performance is not the end to all but it's just something that we are given as a gift that is a glimpse of of heaven really of what's to come which is even uh more than than our greatest um performance experience that we've ever had and that is my my real belief um and so if if i understand that i am part of that journey and part a vehicle for that then my imperfections are something that uh, I love to embrace as something that is part of this process and part of this journey um, of, of getting there. And that also means that I trust in the relationships that I've been given to help me along the way to reach that. And it, that doesn't mean just your, your big name artists, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, because we're all in this together, but it's also, everybody you meet, uh, your students, you know, the people that maybe at first you felt like, oh, there's, I, I can't learn anything from them. There's always something that you can learn. So this, um, the journey of, of, of managing um, these expectations that you have on yourself and also making sure that your inner monologue, because I mean, we are always in dialogue with our, with ourselves, with our own voice that that stays healthy and that we have the courage to, to seek help and that we have yeah, the courage to, um, to, to be vulnerable and to set ourselves up for failure and then to figure out how do we process that failure and how do we move on from that. Um, I think that, that is the key. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I think, you know, there's, it's important to hear people, you know, in your position as a conductor, as a leader, you know, of young people and, and, you know, people in the Milwaukee Symphony and all over and tell, 
others, other musicians, other people that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to ask for help because obviously there is this huge stigma around asking for help, which is the whole reason that you and I are talking right now. And I think, you know, it's huge to admit that uh, here are my shortcomings. I'm laying them out there. I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers. Um, and it's, it's really encouraging to hear that, you know, go get help. Like it's okay to go ask for help. It's okay not to be perfect or be on top of your game every single second of the day. Um, so it's really nice. It's really refreshing to hear that. Well, I mean, ultimately, you know, we are training like, you know, the Olympic athletes, um, you know, who are now disappointed that many of them were thinking probably, you know, this is the last, my last Olympics, you know, and they've been training all their lives or whatever it was. I mean, devastation for them. Um, and, you know, we are, we are much the same in that we have a plan, we have a routine, we have um, ways in which to get to the top level um, of, of performance um, of these huge masterworks that were written or that are still being written. So, uh, you know, that, that takes the utmost because we, we challenge ourselves uh, on a daily basis um, and we need to find a good balance between the things we should just try to get done because yes, they are expected of us. Mm -hmm. And no, we cannot come unprepared, you know, to right. a rehearsal or, or anything. That's, that's not the point, finding, finding excuses. Um, but that we find that it's more important to come prepared, not out of, in, just entirely out of fear. We all have mm -hmm. a level of fear that's, that's healthy mm -hmm. because not fear and that, sense but respect yeah. for the challenge or respect for the mountain that that we have to climb and to for us to understand the level of preparedness that we need or or the tools that we need to get there um, is something that we should regard as something we have to create together and we have to to build up together so that we can reach that and and that's why uh, the encouragement level um, uh, is, is has to be there part of this this the mental health of of reaching that that goal yeah well this has been amazing thank you so much um this has been this has just been awesome and i feel like we all got to know you a lot more from this and you know it's just been really nice talking with you and good to see you too good to see you too um please uh, stay healthy and more ways than one Yes. And uh, I hope that I get to see you and, of course, the rest of, of the group um, sooner than later. Yes. Um, and it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.